So this is the Asus ZenBook Flip S, and it's actually one of the first thin and light notebooks to feature Intel's new Tiger Lake CPUs with XD graphics. Now, given the branding Flip S, uh, it actually is a two-in-one device, so you can use it either in tablet mode, like this, or in laptop mode, like that. Now, I'm typically not a fan of two-in-one devices, but I'm sure it has its own uh, niche market, so um, it does have a few tricks up its sleeve, so let's take a closer look at the ZenBook Flip S right after this. Just when you thought SSDs are getting boring, check out this new team group Cardea Ceramic C440 M.2 PCIe Gen 4x4 SSD in 1 and 2 terabyte capacities with insanely fast read write speeds, but also with that unique ceramic plate for heat dissipation. Check it out below. All right, before I get into the details, I do wanna talk about Intel's Evo branding, which is where the ZenBook Flip S is classified under. Remember Project Athena? It was a program designed by Intel to work closely with OEM manufacturers uh, to design thin and light notebooks that can meet the demands of real world users. So that means a snappy performance, extended battery life, and also being able to get the most bandwidth out of a thin and light form factor. It was initially introduced in 2019, uh, and so now we're here in 2020 where they combined Tiger Lake's architecture with uh, that uh, to basically come with the Evo branding. So according to Intel, the ZenBook Flip S meets all the requirements like supporting quick charge, Thunderbolt 4, Wi-Fi 6, instant wake functionality. What does this really mean for the end user? Let's find out. Starting with specs, our sample comes with the Core i7-1165G7. It's a quad-core processor with eight threads, 16 gigabytes of RAM running at 4267 megahertz, a one terabyte NVMe SSD, and a 13.3 inch 4K OLED display, and it costs $1,500. As for availability, the ZenBook Flip S is an exclusive to Costco in mid-October, and then it's gonna be rolled out into other retailers later this month, or perhaps even later than that. Something I should mention is that if you look at the Ice Lake i7-1065G7, which is a quad-core CPU with eight threads with Iris Plus graphics, it can be configured between 12 watts and 25 watts. With Tiger Lake, any CPU with a zero at the end of its number can be configured between five watts and 15 watts, depending on the system, whereas any CPU with a five at the end of the number, like the 1185G7 from our preview video, can go from 12 to 28 watts. So all this means is the Core i7-1160G7 is a Tiger Lake CPU with four cores and eight threads, and Intel XE graphics with 96 execution units, but much lower clock speeds. Okay, so now let's talk about the design and build quality. And to be honest, it looks a lot similar to the HP Spectre X360. Everything from the copper accent colors on the edges to the interior keyboard layout and the font choice. I mean, I personally don't mind this, but I would have preferred to see something unique from Asus. The top lid features this asymmetrical circle finish, which is a ZenBook staple. But I have to admit, this notebook is a fingerprint magnet. It's almost impossible to keep it clean, so definitely keep that in mind. The hinge is pretty smooth, but it does get wobbly once you have it at a particular fixed location, especially when you have this thing on your lap or on a desk. I think this might have to do with the Ergo Lift design, which basically lifts the keyboard at an optimized angle for a better typing experience, but also if you need better airflow, that's also one of the reasons why they implemented that design. The other thing I should mention is that the rubber grommets underneath failed to keep the laptop in place. It easily moves around, which was a bit annoying, especially when you're typing on and off the keyboard at times. The power button is located on the edge by the I.O. It doesn't really have a tactile feel to it, so every time when I turn this thing on, I would expect it to be on, but it's not because I have to give a little bit more force to get this thing to work. Uh, I think it's a terrible execution by Acer. They really have to fix that because it does get annoying a lot. Uh, I also should mention that uh, for size, this thing is 13.9 millimeters thick and it weighs about 2.65 pounds. So you can easily lug this thing or th toss this in a, into a backpack and carry it with you uh, to a coffee shop or maybe even a school setting. The keyboard is okay. It doesn't have that distinct tactile feel that's present with previous ZenBook devices that we've looked at. It feels a bit mushy. Also, I found the keys to be smaller for my big hands. I constantly found myself making typos. Personally, I think the layout feels vertically restricted. Even Mike, who has small hands, told me that this was uncomfortable. It's also LED backlit with three settings of brightness adjustments. Uh, they do get the job done when you're in darker environments. 
The trackpad is fantastic. You're getting a glass surface, so uh, navigating within Windows is very smooth. The integrated primary left and right buttons have solid tactile feedback. The integrated number pad is just like the one found on the ZenBook 14 that we looked at not too long ago. So if you press this button long enough, it enables it, and there's a brightness adjustment right by the side as well. You can still use the trackpad since the software does well at predicting when you're trying to use the number pad. So this is the webcam quality test on the ZenBook 14. Uh, the video quality looks pretty good. It's pretty nice and detailed, so it should be good for our Skype meetings and all that stuff. Uh, the microphone is not the greatest. It sounds a little bit tinny, but ASUS has built in some advanced AI noise canceling features uh, through the My ASUS app where you can go and tune the settings. So we're gonna go through just a couple settings to showcase what its true capability is. So I'm gonna start off with the single presenter conference call setting uh, that essentially uh, isolates uh, every other noise except for the person who's sitting in front of the display. So let's go ahead and check that out. So this is the single presenter conference call setting and in the background Michael is actually on a phone call talking so it's a good representation on how it actually isolates the noise. He's actually interrupting me right now. I can't focus on what I'm talking to but right now I'm also going to bring in a mechanical keyboard uh, just so you guys can tell how it works. It's pretty incredible. It really is. The speakers are bottom facing and they are custom tuned by Harman Kardon. It sounds pretty good actually. There's good bass response and the vocals are well detailed. So uh, for general media consumption and just you know listening to music or just for your day-to-day -day casual usage, uh, this thing will get the job done just fine. Port selection is decent for a notebook this size. On the left-hand side, you get a full-size HDMI 1.4 port, two USB Type-C Thunderbolt 4 ports. Switching to the right, there's a single USB 3.2 Gen 1 port. But guess what guys? you don't get a headphone jack. I, initially with the ZenBook 14 that had the AMD processor, similar issue, I was absolutely frustrated by that, but they still managed to do the same thing with the Flip S. I don't know why companies are doing this. People use headphones, they, they, this is like the most crucial thing that a lot of people use and not having that, I mean, sure, they do include a 3.5 millimeter adapter in the box, but if you lose that, you're kind of out of luck. And let's be honest, Bluetooth, headphones and windows they do not go well with each other i've had terrible experiences with bluetooth headphones especially with windows notebooks so yeah you're kind of left out of the blue it's really frustrating and i really hope asus fixes that because they clearly do have the room for it it's just that they chose not to moving on to the display you're getting a 13.3 inch 4k oled panel at 60 hertz now i know what some of you might be thinking 4k on a 13 inch notebook is pointless but you know what guys after spending a good amount of time using this thing, I've got to admit, it's freaking incredible. The colors are absolutely beautiful as it covers 100% sRGB, 97% Adobe RGB, and 99% DCI-P3. So this is an excellent option for photographers who want to edit photos on the go. I should also mention that given that this is a two-in-one device, Asus does offer an pen, an accessory pen, that they don't include on the box, oddly enough, because, I mean, this thing is $1,500, they should have included it in the first place, but you can buy that pen as an accessory if you want to take your digital creativity skills to the next level but I think they should have included that with the laptop in the first place. Um, this is also a very bright panel. It gets as bright as 600 nits, so outdoor visibility is, you know, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about that, so that's awesome. As for upgradability, there's not a lot going on over here. The memory is soldered onto the PCB, the SSD is user upgradable, and the drive speeds are really fast. Over three gigabytes per second read-write performance, which is one of the fastest we've seen on a thin and light notebook. Considering this laptop has one of the most power efficient versions of Tiger Lake and a pretty large 67 watt hour battery, I was hoping for amazing things. But that didn't really happen on our web browsing test. I mean, sure, 14 hours would have been a great result if there weren't any Ryzen 4000 U CPUs on this chart. It just seems like AMD really nailed down idle power modes with Zen 2 and Intel's still struggling to keep up. But then again, the 4K screen on the ZenBook certainly doesn't help here either. But then switching over to battery life with a CPU that is actually working on tasks like photo editing and video conversion, well, this is super impressive, but it's also important to put it into context since the ZenBook is only operating at an average package power of 12 watts in standard mode, which gives it a pretty big advantage against laptops uh, that's set to 25 watts or even 30 watts. Okay, so I do wanna talk a little bit about how ASUS has set up the different power modes on the ZenBook Flip S. Their priority is to essentially run this thing at the lowest operating noise as well as chassis temperatures. 
uh, but there's still some flexibility when it comes to overall performance. So essentially there is a network of sensors underneath the laptop skin that identify surface temperatures, and then it adjusts different fan profiles and limits CP package power so that your lap doesn't get too toasty. So what that means is whisper mode will be limited to 22 decibels with the CPU running at just eight watts, while the standard profile allows for a bit more noise and limits power to 12 watts. Finally, performance mode pushes things a bit further with a 13 watt TDP, which is still pretty low since the fans should stick to just 40 decibels. So what does this all mean for overall performance? Well, let's take a look at an extreme example of an Autodesk Maya render to see what happens under full core load. Well, it turns out that the clock speeds between standard and performance modes are pretty similar with the Core i7 1160G7, starting out at around three gigahertz. Performance hangs on to three gigahertz for a few seconds longer, before throttling back uh, while standard sees a gradual decrease, but both end up hitting a pretty constant rate of around 1.9 gigahertz. But standard mode does end up being a lot more consistent. Whisper mode though, well, you're gonna see frequencies all over the place from just 900 megahertz all the way up to quick bursts of around 2.2 gigahertz. The interesting thing here is that temperatures between all three modes were pretty similar, other than the fact that performance in standard modes allowed the CPU to operate around 93 degrees Celsius for just over a minute. But after that, things settled down to the mid 70s and whisper mode was even hitting under 60 in many cases. Remember, a lot of this is focused on surface temperatures, but that also means the CPU has to run cooler as well. Finally, there's power, and it looks like performance mode has a PL2 of around 27 watts for a short burst of time before it settles down to 13 watts while standard mode has a more gradual curve and eventually hits an average of 12 watts. Whisper mode ends up being super power efficient, but each of the increases in frequency and temperature we saw in the last charts is reflected by a spike in power use. Something else I need to mention is the super high initial power spike in standard and performance modes. It only impacts clock speeds for a fraction of a second, and I've actually never seen a laptop CPU do this. It's almost like Intel's algorithm wants to do one thing while the ASUS BIOS just says, nope, behave yourself and listen to me before cutting things back. The interesting thing here is that the difference between ASUS modes can't really be seen in more single core focused apps like Word. Meanwhile, in long multi-core workloads, standard and performance are pretty close while Whisper trails by a massive amount. So what does this all mean? Well, we did run our tests in the highest performance setting, but personally, I would settle for the lowest noise profile from the standard mode because there's very little way in terms of usability. Uh, on the other hand, I would enable Whisper mode if I take this thing to a coffee shop or if I open this thing up on a plane, if that eventually ends up happening because we are currently in the middle of a pandemic. Now these surface temperature claims are pretty evident since the keyboard area keeps cool and even most of the base as well. There's a small hotspot right in the middle, but even if it's on your lap, that won't be too much of an issue due to its location. Uh, in terms of acoustic performance, in the performance mode, the ZenBook Flip S is super quiet, uh, even when working away on a full core workload. All right, moving on to performance. Let's start with the obvious. Now, of course, a low power eight thread Tiger Lake CPU isn't gonna compete against a 16 thread 30 watt Ryzen Monster, or even a 25 watt native eight core Ryzen 4700U. But what's really interesting is the i7 1160G7 is able to convincingly beat the 25 watt i7 1065G7 in multi-threaded workloads. So it seems like the switch to this new architecture is a step in the right direction for Intel, and that's a pretty big deal. Moving on from purely multi-thread applications to more real-world uses for a thin and light laptop, and we see where Tiger Lake really shines. I mean, look, if you're gonna be using your ultra portable device for super intense content creation, then something sporting a Ryzen 4000U is the way to go. But with more general tasks, the ZenBook Flip S is actually pretty impressive. The same goes for Premiere where QuickSync video is able to take over while AMD is still having driver hiccups with their hardware accelerated encode and decode algorithms. Gaming is a bit tough for the 1160G7. Even though it comes with Intel's super impressive new XE graphics core and 96 EUs, its limited amount of power now has to be shared between the CPU and the integrated graphics. And the result isn't all that great. I mean, sure, it can sort of beat the Iris Pro in the Dell XPS 13, but it's taken to the cleaners by the super old Vega architecture. I'd really love to see how this stacks up to the 4500U configured to 15 watts, but we still haven't been able to get our hands on one of those. All right, so I think it's time to wrap up my thoughts on the ZenBook Flip S. Uh, the first thing is, of course, the design. I mean, this thing is, it looks exactly like the HP Spectre X360. I really wish that Asus did something different and unique with this laptop. 
the second thing is, of course, I do want to talk about that two unknown functionality. I personally don't see myself using this in laptop mode and tablet mode at the same time. But if you find yourself doing that, this is probably a great option because that display, the 4K OLED display is absolutely fantastic. It's bright, it's color accurate. And if you watch a lot of movies and content consumption, and if you edit photos, this thing is gonna, it's gonna be an amazing experience. I wasn't particularly fond of the keyboard layout because to me, it just felt like I was making a lot more typos compared to other laptops. So that's something that, something that you should probably try out for yourself and see if you like it. Also, the location of the power button, it's really not tactile. I don't like that implementation. I wish if Asus improved on that as well. But I do have to mention that the AI noise canceling functionality with the webcam and the microphone is fantastic. It works amazing, and I hope other Nobu manufacturers implement that on their laptops because you know we are living in a day and age where we're working from home and we have a lot of things happening around us. So having this functionality is definitely a bonus. Lack of a headphone jack is a huge deal breaker for me personally. I don't know what you guys think about it, but this, I mean, I don't know why Asus did it. <laughs> they should definitely bring it back because it's a crucial element that I personally do to myself using a lot. Uh, but yeah, the performance, it's okay, it's Tiger Lake. I mean, I really, it's definitely not gonna blow your minds compared to what AMD still has with their 4000U series processors. But um, yeah, let me know what you guys think about the ZenBook Flip S. Is this something that excites you? Are you impressed with Tiger Lake's performance? Uh, let us know in the comments down below. I'm Ivo with Hardware Connects. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, spend responsibly, my friends. Spend responsibly. Spend responsibly. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one.